Anyone who's ever done anything worth doing has dreamed big, failed mightily, and mostly started from humble beginnings. This is a podcast about such people. The most fascinating podcast in the world is fascinating because of the stories of the human beings. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Pat DeCerbo, the most fascinating podcast in the world, not because of me, but because of the people that agree to come on the show. Today, we have Mike Borgang. Mike is uh, one of the winningest lacrosse coaches in America. He happens to coach at Niskayuna High School, which is my hometown. I live about 15 minutes from the high school. And uh, Mike had another successful year this year, which he'll talk about. And we're going to talk about his uh, involvement in lacrosse, how he got started, all about his life and uh, his philosophy on winning and a lot of other things. Welcome, Mike. Oh, hey, hey Pat. It's good to, uh, good to be on and talk to you today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. My pleasure. So I'm in the habit of asking people just from the very beginning uh, what their lives were like. And I just wondered, where are you from originally? Uh, Castleton, New York, which is right outside of East Greenbush. So local. Okay. And uh, you went to high school there? I actually went to high school at LaSalle Institute over in Troy. Okay. All righty. Did you play lacrosse in high school? I did. Uh, we didn't have a team until I was a sophomore. So prior to that, <clears throat> I was playing uh, football, played some basketball, ran some track, and then played baseball for a really long time. And then um, my buddy from East Greenbush, who's two grades older than me, started playing lacrosse and then kind of got me into it. And then in 10th grade, our high school got a team. So I was, I was able to play at that point. How was your team back then at LaSalle? Uh, well, our first year we were, we were JV. So, um, you know, we, we played a regular JV schedule. We had uh, a lot of good athletes, but, you know, not very accomplished lacrosse players and their skill level wasn't very high. Um, so we were okay. And then we went to varsity um, and played two years of varsity and we weren't very good. And um, generally because, you know, we just didn't have the amount of kids that were doing uh, lacrosse. They were they were they they were playing lacrosse as uh, their second sport. So um, we did play some tight games in my senior year. I can remember playing Shaker five four, who was a, a perennial power at the time, uh, beating Columbia, who was in the sectional final. So we did have some nice victories, considering we were a, a fledgling program. That had to be fun. <clears throat> yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was, it, it was fun. Um, you know, you have to start somewhere and uh, that's where we started and that's where I started. And then um, LaSalle has gone on to win several sectional championships. And uh, so they do a nice job over there, but yeah, you do have to start somewhere and that's where we started for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, did you play after high school? Did you play in college as well? I did. I played at Cortland state. Um, at the time when I played at Cortland, um, we were a division three school, but half of our schedule, uh, was, uh, division one. Uh, we played against Syracuse in the dome. We played against Cornell, um, who was coming off, uh, losing in the national championship game my freshman year. So that was pretty exciting for me. Played against Penn state, uh, Maryland would come to Cortland, which is by in the Syracuse area. So they would come to Cortland as a opportunity for uh, the Syracuse kids to come down and see them play and, and meet with the recruits and things like that. So we played Maryland. So, uh, um, you know, we played a half division one schedule and then our division three schedule was uh, top of the line. We were always ranked in the top 10 for my four years I was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your childhood like? Do you have any siblings? What was your household like growing up? I do. Um, I have two sisters. One is eight years older than me. One is two years older than me. Um, they both went to school for teaching and, and I did too. So um, I'm not sure how that kind of happened that way. They both went uh, to school to be technology teachers. My oldest sister has her uh, doctorate and my uh, uh, the two, sister that's two years older than me is a master teacher and has every certification under the sun for technology. Um, and then, and then it was me. So there's three of us. Mm -hmm. 
And how about your mom and dad? What they do for a living? Um, I can remember my my earliest moments of being a kid, just going to work with my dad. My dad was a contractor. Mm. He did contracting for over fifty years, um, subcontracting, building houses, doing additions, roofs, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I can remember, you know, a typical Saturday would be us going to uh, a job site and him me holding you know the end of the tape measure and him doing all his measurements and getting everything measured and then we'd go get something to eat at one of the local establishments like Augustus hot dogs or Mike's hot dogs or a fish fry place and you know those are the things that I remember and then going to work with him he was an extremely hard worker um, he'd work from seven in the morning till six at night because he had to be home for dinner at six that was mandatory by my mother and then, uh, so, um, and it was a problem if he wasn't. So, um, and then after we ate, he'd go outside and have a catch with me with a football or a, or a mitt and a ball. And um, then he'd be back in his uh, office in the basement working till about 11 o'clock. So that was kind of a daily thing for him. Worked extremely hard. Uh, my mother too, she was a homemaker, which is probably um just as much work as anybody else ever did. Our, our house was spotless and um, she's an old Italian. So um, food was always ready to go and uh, lunches made, breakfast made. Um, so just, they're both amazing people and they worked extremely hard. And that was the biggest thing that I learned from them was uh, their tolerance for work, for mm. sure. That's a great line tolerance for work yeah i mean even even you, you know endurance as well um it's just uh it's amazing that um you know my dad would coach all my little league baseball teams and you know he'd get out of his truck and he'd walk over eat a sandwich out of a paper bag and you know and then he'd go home and get back in the office and get back to work so um yeah really hard worker and really really good at what he did mm -hmm. it mattered it really mattered to him it was important and that, that word endurance strikes a chord with me too. Um, I don't know. I tell people there's only two things, three things I do. I try to stay married. I work out and I work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those are, and you know, they all take a fair amount of time, you know, for uh, sure. But I can relate to that, you know, after 6 PM when things quiet down, I just work until I go to bed, you know, whether it's reading about work or who knows what sounds to me like you might be a little bit like your mom and dad. Yeah. I mean, the, that's part of the problem is it's really hard to shut off. So, mm. um, you know, um, and it's not just in season, it's all the time. Like you're always trying to make something better, you know, and, um, my biggest issue is shutting it down. Um, and it's really, really difficult for me to do. It's a constant thing that I don't know if it's the way I was just, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if just the way my mind works or whatever it may be. It's just I have a really tough time shutting it down. And there's just like everybody else that that does whatever their job is and they really think it's important. There's those nights where you just wake up and you're like, OK, I got to write that down or I got to get back to work, or I got to do something that, you know, make sure that I don't forget that idea that I just had. So um, really tough to shut down. Can you see this? I can. What do you see? It looks like somebody picking up, pushing a, pushing a boulder. Pushing or a, a big boulder. rock. Yeah, up a hill. Yeah. You know who that is? I don't. That's Sisyphus from the Greek myth. So Greek. In Greek mythology, Sisyphus got, uh, I think it was Zeus got mad at him and, and cursed him to, have to having to push a boulder up a hill for eternity. And most people think that that's a terrible thing. They say, oh, poor Sisyphus, he has to push a boulder up a hill and how absurd it is. And this French guy named Camus did an interpretation of the myth of Sisyphus where he said, Sisyphus's life is no more absurd than anyone else's. And in fact, one must imagine Sisyphus as happy because he has purpose vis-a-vis -vis the rock. And I view my life like that. Like if I didn't have the rock, I'd be lost. So for you and me, maybe we need that and we want that. Yeah, well, that, that's a cool story. I never, 
I never heard that before. And uh, it, it, it does resonate with me for sure. It's like, you know, there's always something to do um, as a coach. And, and I'll, I'll never, ever judge a coach because um, unless I'm in their program, in their shoes, I'm not judging them. And um, so many people want to be the, the Monday morning quarterback and judge what's happening on the field or behind the scenes or um, what have you. But for me, it's like pushing that rock is it's 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 coming up with game plans. It's trying to make somebody better at a certain skill, um, trying to make the group better recruiting. Um, it's, it's all the time. So I can, I can certainly relate to that. I'm just glad I don't got to push a rock up the hill. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great metaphor, right? Because you always have resistance. Like there's always good, yes. you know, there's yeah, so is. many That's moving really cool. parts. Um, so how did you get involved in coaching? Were you, were you involved in coaching like other athletes, even when you were in college or did you wait until after college or, um, I, I was one of those kids in high school that, you know, I wasn't very good at it. Um, my standardized test scores weren't very good and I didn't find success in the classroom. Um, try to tell people all the time, like if, if this kid's a 75 average student and they get an 82 on a test, it needs to be celebrated just like the 100 is celebrated because for them, you know, that's a huge step. And, and for me, I just never saw the difference between an 82 and a 75. If it's just a number, you know, you, you really needed the, uh, affirmation from the person that was, you know, giving you the test or your teacher or somebody to say, Hey, you went up seven points, man. That's awesome. Let's keep it rolling. You know? So for me, um, I happened to be in a military science class and we had to do a presentation. I can't remember what I did the presentation on, but I do remember Sergeant Freeman was the uh, teacher of the class and I did the presentation and he kept me after class and he said, Hey, um, I just need you to know that was really good. Like you got to the point, you, everybody understood what you were saying. Um, and it was a great presentation. You might want to think about being a teacher. And that's, that was in my junior year. And that's what I did. I decided, you know, I like sports, so I'll just be a phys ed teacher. There was no other thought process beyond that. There wasn't like, oh, maybe I'll do this or this. It was just like, somebody said I was good at it. Maybe I am. I'm going to do it. So that was the start of it. I didn't coach any I might have done a, a little camp or here or there, but um, I wasn't coaching. I was kind of just standing there watching and talking to people, not really coaching. And then I went to college and that's kind of where uh, in our phys ed program at Cortland, which is one of the best programs on the East that they, they kind of teach you all about that stuff. And you take classes and you coach and you, and, and you take theory classes and, and, and stuff like that. So that's kind of where it started. Mm hmm. So right out of Cortland, where did you do your student teaching? Uh, I did it in Iskiuna. Okay. So um, I did it in Iskiuna. Um, the funny thing was um, uh, Dr. Steve Goodman from Niskiuna, he wanted to start a lacrosse program at Niskiuna. So I had just, I had to do an extra half a year at Cortland. Mm -hmm. um, so I got home in December and, and in December I'm sitting at my best friend's house, Johnny Keller, who went to union college was a great lacrosse player there. Um, and his mother is a Niskuna resident, um, was when she grew up for, uh, graduated from Niskuna high school. And, uh, he had Steve Goodman had called her on the phone and asked if John wanted to start the lacrosse program at Niskuna high school. And I was 23 years old. Um, I actually wasn't 23 yet. I was 22 at the time. And she gets off the phone and, and presents this to Johnny saying, you know, you know, they want, they were asking, they need a coach, but do you want to do it? And uh, Johnny Keller was an engineer and he working his job and they just both looked at me and I just looked at him like, what? Like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to go and start a lacrosse program. So uh, actually I, I had already said that I would coach at LaSalle with my former coach, Mike Springer. So I'd already had that set up. I like, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Uh, and 
I already told somebody that I was going to help and I, I'm not going back on that. So time went on and my buddy Johnny kept egging me on about it. And I finally called my high school coach and I told him, I said, coach, I said, here's a situation I have. I said, I told you that I was going to help you and that's what I'm going to do. And he just said on the other end of the phone, he said, you'd be crazy to do that. You need to go there and start that program. Maybe you'll get a job there someday. You know, you want to be a teacher. It's a great district. He's like, you need to do that. And that's the only reason I did it. Because if he told me, no, I want you with me, I would have stayed. And the funny part about that was in 1994 was our first varsity year. 1993 was our first JV year when I started coaching. 1994, we played in the sectional championship game in our first varsity year against my former coach in LaSalle. And we ended up winning 5-4. So um, he, we laugh about that now, but back then he didn't, he wasn't very happy about it. So <laughs> <laughs> Now, how did you get the kids ready to be winners that fast? Um, I was just really lucky. Um, <clears throat> I had a bunch of athletes who had been really successful in other sports, primarily soccer and, and hockey. Um, matter of fact, Kyle Waite was one of the, one of the first really good players we ever had. And he had won a sectional championship in soccer, uh, in hockey. And they went to the state finals that year and lost to Ithaca by one in overtime. And then I think it was overtime. And then he won a lacrosse championship in the same year. And he was captain of all those teams. So players like that were the reason why we could compete early. Um, it certainly wasn't because of the X's and O's. It wasn't because of the practice plans. It wasn't because of the preparation. Uh, Cause I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't have a mentor. Um, it was just a 23 year old kid. And these, these kids are 17 and 18 you know, running around on a field. And luckily I had help from the Johnny Kellers of the world come to practice to help me. Scott's lucky he's a division one athlete that would come and help me, a high school friend. Um, and it was really because I fell into a really good situation in a really good community uh, with a lot of good athletes at the time that wanted to try the sport. Mm. So year one, right out of the gate, you win the sectionals. What happens after that? Do you go in the state tournament? Or oh, not? yeah. It was brutal. Yeah, we <laughs> played Yorktown, and uh, their goalie had their uh, had his had his gear off at the end of the first quarter. Can't remember the score, but it was 20-something to two. And mm -hmm. um, that was kind of the start for me where that, you know, um, the expectation level – you know, I, I didn't really know what it was. It just, I was just really, it was burning. Just like I was, I was embarrassed. I was, uh, I, I, I wanted to win, even though I thought we probably wouldn't. Yorktown's a, you know, perennial power, you know, nationally. Um, I, that's where kind of it started. And um, that passion to try to do more to help this program be better kind of came to fruition for me. Um, we have a great community. The parents are unbelievable. Um, the players buy in. Um, but that first year of winning, I think, took the program off. So, you know, it was like, we're, we're winning. We're going to win. So, um, and maybe that's just my perspective because it is a great game and it's a fun game to play. So maybe that was it too. Mm. But it's personal, isn't it? In sports, like that embarrassment, that feeling of whatever it is. Like for me, it was like shame getting my butt kicked. Like I was underprepared and just, I don't know. It's a very deep, deep feeling for a lot of people that take sports seriously. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievably hard. I can recall so many more losses than, you know, mm. tough losses in the state tournament than I can, you know, the the wins and, I guess that's the nature of the beast. There's only one team that can actually win it, win a state championship. And, uh, you know, I watched my daughter's team, uh, great division three team, Geneseo go to two NCAA tournaments and, and lose in the second round to the national champion. And just, you know, I've experienced it on the field and then I got to watch it. It's even worse to watch. I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. harder to watch than it is to go through it for sure. 
I heard a great speech yesterday. It was the Dartmouth commencement address and Roger Federer gave it. And uh, he made mention of his career winning percentage. And he said, do you realize that I won 80% of my matches in my career? And then he said, but I have a question. How many of the points do you think I won? Then he paused and he said 54% of the points. So 54% of the points. When you think of all the mediocre players, now he played a lot of great players too, and he won 80% of his matches, which is a staggering number. But 54% was the number of points, percentage of points he won, which means he's only 8% better on average than the average player which is incredible. It's kind of like I heard a statistic about Tiger Woods years ago where um, when he was at his peak, him compared to the top 10 golfers in the world, he was only one stroke better per round on average than the average of the top 10. And yet he dominated. He won, I don't know, nine uh, nine, uh, PGA tournaments that year. So the margin between winning and losing, it seems to me is remarkably small. I would agree with that. And I would also agree that uh, Tiger Woods and Roger Federer, you know, their, their ability to, you know, the, the, just the, the confidence, the preparedness, everything that they did to get to that point was when it mattered, they won. And, you know, it didn't matter, especially in the big matches or, um, you know, when it got tight, Maybe it's because they're Roger Federer and Tiger Woods is the reason why they were one stroke better or eight percentage points higher is just because of who they are. And the other guy, they're not them, you know, and that's kind of like, yeah, I mean, we can go through stats all we want. And the reality is there's some guys that are just better. The Michael Jordans of the world, the Tiger Woods, Roger Federer's, and it's, it, it, they just continue to win. It doesn't matter if they win by one, they win and they're winners. And that's but cool. I feel like those three athletes, I'll tell you a story about my brother-in-law quick, but he played in the NHL and, and he, he has a lot of talent and you see him skate on our pond and he, he looks like, a, you know, he looks like an NHL player, but I went to his wedding and the best man in his wedding was this guy named Scott. And I said, hey, Scott, was PJ always the best player on the team? His name was PJ Stock, and he played for four NHL teams, including the Bruins. And he said, no, PJ wasn't the best player on the team. I was. And I was like, oh, well, why aren't you in the NHL? And he said, PJ willed himself to be in the NHL. And he worked harder than all of us combined. And so did Michael Jordan. And so did Roger Federer. And uh, so did Tiger Woods. Like one thing Federer said in his speech yesterday, or whenever it was, he said, people used to say, I make the game look effortless. And he said, it really annoyed me because they had no idea how much work went into making it look effortless. <laughs> I thought, what a great. Yeah. And, and another thing he said that was really cool, and I think Tiger and Michael had this too, um, if they did make a bad shot, they moved on. And, uh, you know, a lot of players can't. A lot of players get stuck on what's behind them. I try to tell kids all the time, you know, have the mind of a guppy or a goldfish. Like, it, you, you got to have that mentality. If you're a shooter, then, you know, uh, you're just waiting for the next shot. You know, it's not about, oh, that shot was this X, Y, or Z. We could talk about that later and analyze it on film. But at the, at the end of the day, like, you know, as I said, Roger Federer knows I'm winning the next point. Mm -hmm. And that's the mindset that you try to translate to athletes at any level. I mean, once they get to high school, I mean, we're not telling, you know, our, our youth athletes, it doesn't really matter. As long as they're on the field, running around playing and having fun, they can't do anything wrong. But at the point they're going to, they're going to come to, to, to a high school program and they're, they're a division one player or they're ranked nationally in this, uh, nationally as a player, or they're a four or five star athlete, which is, you know, we have in lacrosse that at that point is, you know, you cannot be concerned with, you know, what just happened. It's, it's the next play. And I know it sounds cliche, but 
you know, the mind of a goldfish is what I say to all those kids is like, just be a guppy for a second, will you? You know, let's just move on and go. So, yeah. Great metaphor. So you've been there now since, uh, what was your first year, 93? Yeah, 93. And uh, how many sectional championships have you had? Um, we have won 20 sectional championships. Um, and we've been in the sectional final championship game 25 times. So out of 30 years, we've been there 25 and 120. And how about state championships? We have one state championship and uh, we've been to three state championship games. And that's funny too, because the way they do it regionally is that, uh, you know, we have to go, uh, section two has to go through, you know, the Hudson Valley region, region, which is section one, and then Long Island, which is section eight and 11. And um, it's a tough road. They don't rotate it. Long Island's uh, New York state is one of the best states for lacrosse in the country, probably the top state. Long Island's probably the top region and they don't rotate that. So um, it's just a grind to try to get through the Long Island teams. And uh, we had many battles, one, two goal games against them that would have got us to the final and, uh, it's just a tough road when you got to go through Long Island. Mm -hmm. And honestly, uh, I get the, you know, 492 program wins, you know, the 25 Superman Council championships, 23 undefeated, all that stuff. I get that. But the reality is, you know, development of the player, development of your team. And my whole goal is if these kids want to go play in college, I want to prepare them for that. And if I prepare them for that, then, you know, the winning takes care of itself. We've won 91% of every game we've ever played. And we've won 97% of every game ever played in the suburban council. And all those stats are cool. But the reason that happens is because we have so many kids that aspire to play at the next level that if they're prepared for going to play at the division one, two or three level in college, then winning takes care of itself in the state. It's interesting. I've, I've heard about you from a lot of different people, even though we don't know one another. Um, in fact, I went to college with John Keller, but I didn't know that you guys were buddies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Funny. Since we've been five or That's I was five funny. and you seven. Yep. That's great. Um, and then some of your college friends, I think I mentioned to you, uh, I went to high school with Ben Pearson. Yep. From yep. up in Galway. But yeah. Um, yeah. So at this point, I'm assuming, like, I mean, your focus, I'm assuming your purpose, whatever that is, the, the rock, like it's, it's more than just wins and losses, it seems to me. Yeah, it doesn't have anything to do with that. Uh, mm -hmm. It has to do with player development um, as far as well, an athlete, but uh, not just as a lacrosse player. Uh, we spend countless hours in the weight room. Um, we also spend hours developing speed, which has taken me forever to learn that you can in you can increase your speed um, exponentially by doing the right things. Um, you know, my son, you know, went, you know, there's something called the flying ten, which is what a lot of people do for speed and they record times, we record, we rank, we publish times. And, uh, you know, he got his speed from exponentially faster. He's down to 0 0.96 flying 10, which is really, really fast. But he did that through the training. So it's not just about throwing the ball off the wall. It's about, it's about the whole experience of being an athlete trying to encourage these guys to get enough sleep, which they don't trying to get the guys to understand the nutrition pattern and, and uh, you know, carrying a, a gallon of water bottle around all day long and drinking it. It's, it's, it's about the experience. And like I said before, if we can get them ready to play at the college level, I mean, we've had 20 national champion champions come out of this unit. Um, so if we can get them ready to play at the next level, then, the wins and losses will take care of itself. And, and beyond that, just being a good human, like just be a good guy, you know, let's start there and then, then we'll move forward. And, and um, you know, those are the things that are important to me, you know, um, 
it's the process to get to the season that wins you games during the season. So mm-hmm. winning games is only just a result of all the things you do to, when you get there. Mm-hmm. So I'm thinking to myself, with a winning percentage of 97% in the Suburban Council and 91% overall, uh, you must get a lot of phone calls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The recruiting, the recruiting is just another, it's another animal. Um, on September 1st, college coaches at the Division One level can now start contacting um, lacrosse players. So it's July 1 right now. Um, or July 2nd now. So in two months, um, they can start contacting players and um, the, the academies, Air Force, Navy, and Army can start on July 1. Uh, they get that month advantage over the other uh, 70 plus Division One schools. So, and when I say 70 plus Division One schools, there's only 76 that play Division One lacrosse. And there are so many kids now that are playing like to get an opportunity to do that is, uh, is, is a big deal. And, uh, actually just to play any sport at the college level at any level to me, um, there's nothing better. There's nothing that can teach you more. There's nothing that gives you, when you walk in, uh, you, you have a peer group, you have like-minded people for the most part. Um, the, the organizational skills and, and all the things that it teaches you, and winning and losing is kind of what life's about. So the more that you can win and lose and actually failure teaches you even more, the more that you can do those things um, when you're trying to reach common goals it is, is unbelievably important. So, yeah. So phone calls, division one, division two, division three. Um, we have kids getting on September one, getting 35, 40 phone calls from, from 70 division one schools or, um, the last kid we put in division one, he had 26 phone calls. So yeah, it is a process for sure. It's an all the time thing, Mm -hmm. especially with the transfer portal. I was kind of thinking Mike Vorgang gets calls from colleges, other high schools, people want to pay you more money. (laughs) But Um, no, I can tell you, I, I, uh, when I was younger, um, I had a couple great opportunities. Uh, I got a funny story when, when I was, I was, I had to still, I, I, I went out on my own and I ran out of money. I had to come home and was living at home for a while and realized this is a pretty good deal. Like my mother's making my breakfast, my lunch, you know, uh, this is pretty good. Uh, except for the fact that I'm living at home at 24 years old. I, uh, I got a call from, um, uh, Scott Anderson. He was the Harvard head coach at the time. And, I got home and my mother said to me, uh, uh, there was a note that was written, said Scott Anderson from Hartford called. And I went in and said, hey, mom. I said, Scott Anderson, right? She said, yeah. She goes, yeah, from Hartford. I go, well, no, Scott Anderson's the head coach at Harvard. And she's like, well, why would he want to talk to you? I go, <laughs> I don't know, because I'm the opposite of Harvard. So, um, but it was, it was an opportunity for me to go there and uh, um be an assistant coach when I was younger. And uh, I said to Scott Anderson, I said, Hey, I said, I'm trying to get my master's degree because I'm a teacher. And um, I'm at Russell Sage College in Troy trying to get, you know, my master's degree. I had to beg to get in that program. Um, you know, I need to get my master's. And he goes, Well, you can just get it here. I go, Where? Harvard? He was like, started laughing and we had that conversation about uh, doing my higher education there. And then there were a couple other colleges the next few years. And I just realized I wanted to stay close to my parents. They, they, they both passed recently and I wanted to be close to them. And that was the most important thing to me was, uh, was that that was more important than moving on. So uh, I did have a few of those opportunities. Um, you know, I've had, you know, uh, high school opportunities come up all the time, but, why would I leave the best place ever? So I don't need mm. to do that. Agreed. We live in a nice town. Yeah, it's a good place. Amen. So are you the kind of guy that thinks about retirement someday or will you do this as long as possible? Um, I, I don't really think about it. Like I had my, like I said, my daughter, um, she played in college and I was able to get to a bunch of her games and, and uh, my son 
was at Denver. Uh, that team went to the Final Four last year. He was hurt. He's decided to go into the transfer portal and go to Rutgers um, University, uh, which I'm ecstatic about. And um, Big Ten school, uh, awesome place, great academic support. But um, quick drive too. Quick drive. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I, when my son or my daughter had heard from somebody else, that, you know, somebody had told them that this year in 2024 was my last year. Um, I don't know why they heard that, but they heard it from somebody and uh, they just looked at me and said, what do you mean? Why would you ever do that? What are you doing? You know, so, you know, for them to say that to me means they get it. If I have to miss a game, they get it. They understand what I do. And, you know, they're, they're certainly okay with it. And that's, you know, that's, that's the most important thing to me that, that, you know, they looked at me like I had, you know, like I was, like I had four heads, like, why, what do you mean? You're not, you're not going to coach next year. What are you going to do? what else can you do? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know the answer. So at this point, we're going to just keep rolling it forward. Mm -hmm. So is, is there anything that uh, you feel like you haven't accomplished that you want to accomplish at this point? Um, what do you think about as far as goals moving forward? No, I don't, I don't really have any goals as far as, you know, accomplishments. It's just the simple things like, you know, having a high standard for certain things and, you know, the, um, the constraint led approach of coaching that I've been researching for a while, you know, you know, having a high standard. So for example, just having a high standard for setting screens or, you know, specific things that, you know, we think are important for the practice that day. Um, Cause to be honest with you, the only thing that I care about is improvement. And I care about the players improving to the point where they feel really good about their skill set, really good about how they play the game of lacrosse and, and, and hopefully they'll be able to play it for a really long time. But as far as goals for me, I don't, I don't, uh, it doesn't matter to me. It's irrelevant. It's, it's more about, you know, uh, trying to get better as a coach, trying to be a better person and, and handle situations better, um, uh, trying to deal with hard situations in a way that 20 years ago that I'm better than. So um, uh, John Paliza down at uh, Russell Sage was a great teacher and uh, he, he would always use the word, actually wrote a book, I think about better, like that word, you know, it, it has become super important to me. Like, can I just be a little bit better than I was? You know, can I improve? You can put a percentage on it, 1% each day. Or if I do 10,000 hours, am I going to be, you know, proficient at something? Or, But um, setting high standards, you uh, becoming a better coach, and dealing with situations that are hard, I think, are my goals. You're preaching to the choir. I mean, every day I say I want to be better and do better. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And some days you're not better. And some days I'm really bad. And mm -hmm. I tell the kids all the time, I'm like, uh, I finally come to the point where I just look at them and say, let me be me. You know, you know, it's some days it's going to be better than others. Some days I'm going to get on your case about certain things that maybe I was wrong about, but just let me be me for, for two hours here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you know who I am, you know, what's going to happen. So just let it happen and be okay with it. And then we'll have a conversation. So, um, yeah, just trying to be better all the time. That's it. That's the only goal. Yeah, me too. And to me, that's where like that word purpose comes from. And the metaphor is the rock, you know, because, because it's got to be hard. If it wasn't hard, you wouldn't be growing and it wouldn't be interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and it starts with failure. You know, it starts with the ability not to be able to do something. And then you're so like, there's something in you that says, I'm going to master that, mm -hmm. you know, and that, and that's your purpose, just like you're saying. So, you know, so, and that, I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. No, go when ahead. I, when I was a little kid, Mike, my, my father bought me a pogo stick and uh, did you jump on a pogo stick? ever? Yeah, I had one. Yep. And I had stilts. Oh, wow. So. You could have been in the circus. <laughs> well, my dad, my dad built them. 
of course. So. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I couldn't do that pogo stick at all. I was just a spaz. And eventually I was determined to learn and I got really good at it to the point where I could go with no hands, just jumping on it and stuff. And um, it's just been a metaphor for me for my entire life for something I could not do and couldn't imagine myself doing and then got good at it. And at this point I do triathlons. I do big, I do Ironman triathlons because they're scary because the, they force me to stay in shape because I know what it's like. Per- to- yeah. That's your purpose. Yeah. Amen. That's why you so do it. Business, fitness, family. Those are the three things for me. Nothing um, wrong with that. I just, I don't, I don't have any bandwidth for anything else really. Um, but you seem really yeah, clear on I purpose. Was, Sorry, I was folks. just going to say to you, do you have any fish in that pond of yours? You said <laughs> somebody true. was skating on a pond. If you got fish over there, like you said, I don't really do anything. And I just started fishing over COVID. It's just funny that I have no hobbies. I don't golf. I don't, uh, I, I, I don't play lacrosse anymore. Um, I used to until I was in you know my early fifties and I just, you know, there's just too much. I just stopped. So, um, and it's funny, you talked about the pogo stick too, only because how many kids now are jumping on a pogo stick or walking on stilts or jumping out of a tree or um, swinging on a swing and jumping off that or jumping a fence. So, you know, when doing all this research on strength training and trying to get our kids better at things, I came across a gentleman, I can't remember his name, that said, you want to get young kids stronger, meaning elementary school kids and middle school kids, have them jump off high things. Mm -hmm. have them jump off high things because they don't do it like we did when we were kids you know you jumped out of a tree you landed that uh radiation went up through your heels and into your hips and into your your brain and you realize oh i need to land on my uh uh, you know on on my on my on my toes on my on the balls of my feet and uh kids don't even learn that nowadays so i thought it was funny you talked about the pogo stick and then i thought about the guy saying kids don't even jump off high things just let them do that they'll get stronger so um but i thought that was pretty cool me too um there's a book that was written by another union grad probably johnny's here his name is matthew futterman and he writes for the new york times he's their head of their sports writing and uh he wrote this book running running on the edge i think it's called and he talks about how joe v hill i think his name is at northern arizona state they win like the cross country championships every year and uh, or every other year. And he has some jump off of like a six foot platform mm-hmm. to, to teach him how to land and, and also fires your nerves, I guess, somehow. In a way. Yeah. The depth. Yeah. They're, they're called depth jumps where they jump okay. off that high stuff and they land and they, yeah, it's, it's, it's all central nervous system. You know, that's why, you know, I know you're talking about what you do. Um, but our athletes aren't running a marathon. Um, if, if they're doing anything over five seconds, it's too long. Mm. Like a lot of these, still, these college coaches, will, they'll, they'll come in and these college lacrosse coaches will test you in the mile. I don't care how slow you can run a mile. And I'm saying mm. it that way because I don't care how fast you can run it because your central nervous system is not being affected until you sprint. And that's mm. all you should do. Um, so, like I said, our athletes have gotten better because of uh, the Mike Boyles of the world that I researched, the Feed the Cats information that I, I listened to, uh, you know, and the guy that does Feed the Cats, his name escapes me, and I can't believe it because I just watched the video last night, but, you know, he, he calls his program Feed the Cats because cats sprint or they sleep or they mm. walk. They don't jog anywhere. So, um, you know, for us, it's like we're sprinting or we're not running, you know what I mean? So, or we're, you know, the fastest thing you can do to affect your central nervous system is sprint. And we do it for 10, you can do it for 10, 10 yards, you can do it for 20, you can do it for 30. Uh, we choose 10. And one of the second fastest thing you can do is hang clean. And other than that, there's not much, anything you can do that's faster than that. And that affects the central nervous system like uh, sprinting does. So, um, it's crazy what you learn over time. Cause I used to have kids go, Oh yeah, go for a run, uh, go run two, three, four miles. That'll get you in shape. Yeah, it will. But we don't want you to be in that kind of shape. Mm, interesting. 
Well, we're getting to the end. Is there anything that I haven't asked that you might like to talk about or anything that you think is important, like about your philosophy on life or about maybe what I should be thinking? Yeah, I mean, I just think that, you know, it's really important. You know, I've thousands and thousands of athletes, uh, whether at Nisqueno High School or my club program or camps that I've done over years. And, you know, I think the, the biggest piece of advice that I could give a parent, regardless of the age of your son or daughter, is truly know who they are. You know, um, objectively take a look at who your son or daughter is as an athlete and, and, and listen to their coaches. And if you do that, then it's great. You know, as a parent, I tell them all the time, it's just, you know, tell them they did a great job. Give them a hug and a kiss and tell them you love them. That's it. You know, um, for me, um, I generally don't have problems, but the issue that I see is parents really don't understand who their kids are athletically. Um, and I think it's pretty simple. If I watch the game and my son or daughter dominates, I know they're pretty good. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think it's any harder than that. It's an eye test. You got to take the emotion out of it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to see even they may have a good day or a bad day, but are they dominating? If they are, guess what? They're good. If they're not, then that's okay. Know who they are and help them, help them mm -hmm. improve. But that's important to me. Mm -hmm. So no matter where they're at, know where that is and help them. Know where that is and, and help them and be there, be there in the moment with them. And that's the most important thing. Find out what their weaknesses are and, and, and encourage them to improve upon that. And a lot of kids don't want to do it. And if they don't, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. That's okay. You know, um, a lot of times they don't, they just like it and they're, they like to play and have fun and that be with their friends. That's all they want. And that's okay too. They don't have mm -hmm. to be Michael Jordan, Roger Federer, or Tiger Woods. It's okay. Or Mike Forgan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, thank you so much for your time. It was great to visit with you and congratulations on all your success. And I just love your philosophy. I think it's great. I'm, I'm not surprised by it at all. It's like the little decisions every day. I tell people like a kid called me yesterday to talk about work. And he says, you know, what is it? What do you do? What do you do? And I was like, I, I get up early. I go to bed early. I eat right. I work out and I work hard at my job. Like I just, it's all the little decisions, you know, put together, but there, there is some, you point out that there's some very important things that uh, not only do you have to do the work, but you have to do the right work as you pointed out as in doing 30 yard sprints instead of running three miles for, if you're a lacrosse player. So you yeah. gave me a lot, a lot to think about. It was great to hear from you and, I have no doubt you'll continue on as a as a great success in whatever you decide to do, and it's certainly in lacrosse. Well, thanks, Pat. I truly appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Me too. Have a great afternoon. All right. All See right. you later. Yes, sir. Bye, Mike. If you enjoy the most fascinating podcast in the world, please follow on Spotify, subscribe on YouTube, and follow on Apple Podcasts.